Hey everyone, um, okay, we're gonna get started. So remember today, project one is due, so make sure you turn that in on Gradescope. Uh, and homework three is be being released today too, so that'll be due next Thursday um, at midnight. And project one is due today at midnight. Anyone have any questions on that? Yeah? How much is the link? Undisclosed. <laughs> Uh, but it's it's not big, so it's not like the end of the world if you turn it in late. Yeah. So yeah, remember you have like one week to turn it in late if you can't turn it in on time. Okay, cool. Um, we're gonna get started. So today we're gonna be learning um, about SVMs, and SVMs are really cool. Um, they're like a bunch of stuff you can go do with them, and they have a lot of interesting properties. So it's gonna be really fun to analyze them. And so today is going to draw on like a lot of different areas of math. So um, it can get mathy at times. Um, that's okay. Just like if you don't understand something, just like feel free to ask me questions. Like raise your hand anytime, um, or ask on the Piazza Piazza questions thread. Um, and also like I'll try to focus like not focus too much on like the exact math, but just like the overall concepts and what you should be taking away from it. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Also. I tried to do this thing last time where if someone asked me a question, I asked like asked you your name so I could get to know you people better. But I like stopped doing that. So if you ask a question, like also say like hi, I'm Rohan, and then like ask your question so I can know you. Okay. Cool. Um. So today's agenda. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, basically, right today we're gonna talk about classification. So we're given a bunch of data, and we want to say you know it's in the positive co class or the negative class. Um, so let's first take it simple, right? We're going to assume that our data is nicely divided like this. So there's like a clean separation between them, and that we only have two classes, meaning positive and negative, only two uh, categories. Okay, so what can we do about it, right? So the easiest thing is just draw a line through it, right? This line tells us, you know, if it's above this line, it's red, if it's below the line, it's blue. Pretty simple, right? Okay. What makes this line good? Why is this a good line? Anyone have any guesses? Yep. Yep, and your name? Jordan? Cool, yeah, so Jordan's right, right? So what she's basically saying is that the line is far from both these points, right? From the points on either side. So it finds like this best 
separating distance right in between them. That's what make this, makes this a good line. So it's far from the data points near. So uh, what are SVMs, right? SVMs are basically this, a supervised classification algorithm um, that finds this optimal line. That's all SVMs are. They find this optimal line in your data set. Um, so in multiple dimensions, we don't call this a line, we call this a hyperplane. But it's essentially finding this optimal line between your training points. And the hyper, this hyperplane is far from the nearby points, and this gives you a nice separation, which is what you want. So going back to this case, it gives you a nice separation between your training points. And we want to find this optimal line that gives you the best separation. And yeah, it's like one of the most widely used um, algorithms in practice. OK, cool. So this is, let's define some vocabulary. So the optimal hyperplane is the one that best divides your line. Um, so for example, this one, there are, many, there are multiple hyperplanes that we could draw through these data points that all correctly classify the, these training data points. So th there's the, these like three green ones in addition to the red one. Um, that correctly classify all these training points. Can someone tell me why the red one is better than these any of these green ones? Yeah, no. Pardon? Right, exactly. It's farthest from the smaller points, right? So we want to find this opt this hyperplane that has the optimal property. It divides all our data points, and it's the furthest away from the nearest data points. Does it make sense to everyone? Okay, cool. So we're going to define this notion of a margin. So the margin is basically the distance from your hyperplane to the nearest training point, or to the nearest data point. So for here, for example, our margin is this distance, from our line to this yellow point, and from this line to this blue point over there, over here. Can someone tell me why the margin is not bigger on one side than the other? Yep, in the back. Ex exactly, right? So this hyperplane is right in between these two points. Um, why, if it was more to, to one side, we could find a more optimal hyperplane by pushing it towards the center, therefore maximizing the distance it has to any other point, right? So this margin is even on both sides. So how many points define this margin in this example? Yep. Two, right? So the hyperplane, the margin is defined as the, the distance from this line to the nearest point. So all these points don't really matter in terms of the margin, right? Only this point is going to matter on this side, and only this point is going to matter on this side. So in this example, there are only two points that determine our margin. Yep. Oh, these, these, this point, these points are the closest from our hyperplane. Oh, yeah, um, that's like the rest of the lecture. So, uh, yeah, we'll go through like how to find this uh, hyperplane. But yeah, good question. Okay, cool. Um, what's the maximum number of points that can be on the margin? Yep. Yeah, exactly, right? If I had like n over 2 points right on this margin here, n over 2 points on this margin here, that would make all my points on the margin. So what, ha what has to be true? If I have multiple points on the same side of a margin, what has to be true about them? Uh, yeah? Uh, yeah, exactly. They have the same distance to the hyperplane, so they're parallel to the hyperplane. And they lie on the same margin line. So uh, that's going to be a key concept that we, uh, you, should, you, you should remember. So yeah, this margin is this empty region with no data points in it. And um, basically, it's. The margin is the whole thing, so it's the twice the distance from the hyperplane to the nearest point. Okay, cool. So, so you know, we talked about like this margin is de being defined by these points closest to it. Let's give them give them a name. They're called support vectors. So this is where support vector machines gets its name. This margin is solely determined by these support vectors, and these are the data points that lie on the margin. So in this case, it's only two support vectors. But if you had more, more data points right on this line, um, as close to this hyperplane as these other two, 
those would also be support vectors. And so if you if you look at this decision boundary, right, this high complaint is determined by only these two support vectors. If I change any of these points around, if I shuffle them around a bit, that wouldn't change my hyperplane. So that's the reason we call them support vectors, because this hyperplane depends or supports on just these vectors closest to the plane. Yep. Right, yeah, exactly. So if you if you if you shuffle something closer to the hyperplane, yeah, then you would reclassify that as a support vector. But if something stayed not a support vector, then it doesn't matter where that point is. It's just not a support vector. So it doesn't really matter. Yep. So uh -huh. uh, right. So um, we started with the assumption that our data was cleanly separable. So if we have not linearly separable data, that's something we'll get to later in the lecture. Cool. Yeah. So only changing the support vectors change our decision boundary. So let's uh, let's add some math to it, right? So this decision boundary can be represented by wx plus b equals zero. So here w and x are vectors. So x here is our data point. This is our data point vector. Um, some some feature version of our data point. W is our weight vector, and B is some bias we add. You can think of B as like a y-intercept. So in 2D, this is just mx plus B, right? Um, in multiple dimensions, now this is like a dot product between two vectors. So our hyperplane is defined by the line wx plus B equals 0. And the, the, each of the lines on the margins, they're defined by the equations wx plus B equals negative 1 and wx plus B equals 1. Um, there's no b in there because they incorporated like the b as a constant term in, like the x. So like, you know, you can just add like you know a one in the x vector, and then you have an extra coefficient in w. But it's the same thing essentially. So we have these three lines: one for the hyperplane right in the middle, wx plus b equals zero, um, and then the edges of the margins: wx plus b equals one on the top and negative one on the bottom. Any questions so far? Okay, cool. So remember, y equals 1 for the blue dots and y equals negative 1 for the orange dots. So what can we say about this, right? Do we want to find a hyperplane such that all of these blue points are correctly classified and the orange points are correctly classified? So what does that mean mathematically? That means for all the yi's that are 1 or all the y's that are blue, we want this dot product wx plus b wx plus b to be greater than 1. So if, w, if y, yi equals 1, right, we're looking only at these blue points, then wx plus b will be at least 1. And it, it's 1 only if it's a support vector on this margin. And if it lies outside this margin here, it'll be greater than 1. Does that make sense? Yep, Jordan? Oh, uh, y is just a plus 1 or negative 1 for the class. So it's a positive and a negative class. So we're just dealing, dealing with a simple two-class case here. Yep. Yeah. W is our uh, coefficient vector. So um, just think of it as like in, for example, linear regression, you have these features, and then you have like your weights. So these are your weights. Yep. So yeah, W is what we're optimizing over. We're changing W, so this this holds. So yeah, we're just laying out we're just laying out the constraints right now. We haven't talked about how to find W. We're just saying this must be true. Any questions? Oh, right, cool. And same thing for the opposite, right? We have for all the y's that are orange, for all yi that equals negative 1, we want wx plus b to be less than negative 1. Because if it's negative 1, it'll lie on this margin. If it's less than that, it'll be below this, below this hyperplane. Um, so it's going to be exactly minus 1 and 1 if they align the um, margin. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so we have these constraints, right? Wx plus b equals 1 and negative 1, depending on the class. We can rewrite this. If we multiply both sides for the case y equals 1, we have yi times this equals 1 times yi, which equals 1. Right? So 
y times w, y times w x i plus b must be greater than one. If y y equals one, and we can show the same thing for this on the opposite side. If y is negative one, then we multiply both sides. We still get y i times w x i b is greater than greater than one. So so the takeaway is that. It doesn't matter what the class is, this equation has to be greater than 1. And having, you know, the yi's be negative and, you know, your prediction be negative will all cancel, cancel itself out. So just to recap, recap briefly, we have our decision boundary denoted by wx plus b equals 0. Our margins are denoted by wx plus b equals 1 and wx plus b equals negative 1. And we want this to hold such that all our data points, y times wx plus b, is greater than 1, greater than or equal to 1. And it'll be 1 exactly if it's a support vector. Does this kind of make sense? Does anyone have any questions on this so far? OK, cool. So, um, so let's talk about this, what this W really means um, and how we can derive W. So W here, um, if this is our, if this is our um, hyperplane, the vector W points in the direction orthogonal to that. So I'm going to look at these two points here, x plus and x minus. These are two support vectors that lie on each side of the margin, or on each margin. So I'm going to specifically look at x plus minus x minus, which is this residual. And if I take this and I project it onto the vector w, I can get the width of the margin. Does everyone see that? If I take this green line and I project it onto w, I can get the width of the margin. Um, so let's go through that, right? So the width of the margin is a projection onto w of x plus minus x minus. So x plus is here, this is x minus. And that's our residual vector. So the projection, or the width, is just you know x plus minus x minus and times the projection on w, which is just w over its norm. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense to everyone so far? We're just we're just deriving what the width of this margin is. Okay. Cool. So we know that for all support vectors, um, for all support vectors, this is true because y times w plus wx plus v must equal one support for support vectors. So when y equals one, we can rearrange it to say wx equals one minus v, and when y equals negative one, we can rearrange that to say wx equals negative one minus v. So plugging these two into our equation over here. We get that the width equals one minus b minus one minus negative one minus b over the norm of w, which equals two over the norm of w. Okay, so let's take a step back. If you didn't follow that along, this is this is a takeaway that you need to take away, right? We just derived that the width is inversely proportional to the norm of w. That means if we're trying to maximize the margin, we're trying to find we're trying to find the hyperplane such that this margin is maximized because that's our ultimate goal, right? That means we need to minimize the normal w. Let me repeat that again. To maximize the margin, we want to minimize the norm of w. Yep. Like the norm of W for so like this is typically like the two norm. So like W, if the entries are like W one, W two, then it's like W one squared plus W two squared plus W three squared, all square root. Yeah. What would that look like on the? I mean, I understand W is on the. What would you minimize there? Do you have to give that W vector that you showed? You mean here? Yeah. Yeah. And how would like minimizing the norm of W be? Like what would W? Uh, yeah, okay, so this, 
So this is the case for an arbitrary w. Okay. So you can think of this as like your line wx. Yeah. So w is orthogonal to this line wx. Yeah. So what we're essentially saying is that minimizing that norm maximizes the margin between them. And you can see that through the projections. Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So yeah, to maximize the margin, you want to minimize w. So this is a final problem formulation, right? So we want to minimize the normal w. Here we just square it at a 1 half so because it helps with gradients. Um, so we want to minimize the normal w such that this is true for all data points. And why do we add this constraint? This is to, to make sure we correctly classify all points. Yep. What happens if it's impossible to like, Yeah, yeah. You're kind of jumping ahead. But yeah, if, if your data is not linearly separable, then this does not have a solution. So you can't, you can't solve this. But yeah, we'll get to that in a bit. OK, cool. So yeah, so, so this is really great. But let's take a step back, right? What's like the one key assumption? And you know, our friend gave it away. But what's the one key assumption we made before doing this derivation? Exactly, right? We assumed that our data was linearly separable. So if our data is not linearly separable, we will never be able to find a w such that this holds. This constraint will like will have to be violated. So there will be no solution to this problem formulation. So for example, right? Here in the case, we have linearly separable data. We can ensure that w that uh, y times wx plus b is always um, at least one. In this case, we have some orange points crossing over the boundary. So for this case, here y is negative, and wx plus b um, will also be negative. But, but this point is relying on the other side. So this equation will not hold for this, this particular point. Does that make sense? Because if we move, for the, for the equation to hold for that point, we have to move the margin up. And if we move the margin up, now we're violating the equation for this blue point. So we can never get all the equations satisfied for this data. So does anyone have any ideas on how to fix this? Spaghetti noodling. I mean, we're not spaghetti noodling. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Oh, that's that's a very good idea. Yes. Um, that that is something we'll get to in a bit. But something a little, maybe a little more simple. Yep. You can maximize the number you classify correct, and then the optimal Right. Okay. Cool. So that's a really good idea, right? We want to maximize the number. Um, uh, the number of optimal points that we can classify correctly. Um, so what about the points, like, what do we do about points we can't fit correctly? Do you have an idea about what we do about them? Okay, so, so here we're going to, oh, yeah, question? Oh, yeah, um, so not support vectors, but a, uh, a different terminology, and we're going to call them, um, we're going to call them slack variables, which, which, which we'll see in a bit. So one thing to note here is now, now our support vectors are not only the points that lie on the margin, as in this case, but also the points that violate the margin. So for example, cross over to the other side. So here, the orange is not on the margin, but it's on the other side of the boundary, which is why it's a support vector. So all of these oranges are still not support vectors, but the, this orange is a support vector, this blue is a support vector. OK, cool. Just to make that clear. Uh, yeah, and changing these will change the boundary as well. OK, yeah, so, so we can no longer say that this is true because it's impossible, right? No such w and v exist. So one way to fix this is to add a slack for each data point. So each data point is free to cross the boundary as much as its slack will let it. And we can kind of control the slack. So for example, if there's one data point, Maybe it's okay that it crosses the boundary because, because it has some slack. So let's kind of show this uh, with a picture, right? So here we have our uh, y equals 0 line, y equals 1, and negative 1. It's flipped in this diagram, but it doesn't really make a difference. So if, if, I'm, if I'm on the right side of my uh, margin, suppose I lie directly on the support vector, and I'm on the right side of the margin, what do you think my slack should be in this case? The slack is denoted with this variable. 
What do you think my slack should be? It's like kind of on the picture. Zero. Yeah, it's zero, right? Like, I don't need any slack to like to move over to the other side because I'm already on the right side, right? Uh, same thing. With, so anything that's correctly classified, like below or above the margins, or on the on the margins, has a slack of zero. But for example, if I want to cross, suppose here, right? I, I belong to this negative to this positive side. But I'm like maybe halfway to halfway to um, the decision boundary. I'll have a slack of I have some slack, but it'll be less than one, right? If I'm totally crossing over the decision boundary to the other side, I'll have, to have a slack of greater than one, and that's because the distance between these planes is one, as we defined. Y equals zero, one, and negative one. Does that make sense? So here we're give, essentially giving these variables some slack so that they can cross over to the boundary. And so that we can still have a solution to the problem. OK, cool. So now our constraint becomes y times wx plus b is greater than or equal to 1 minus its slack for all the data points. So for example, if our slack was 0.5, then we could be 0.5 away from the margin, or 0.5, viol 0.5 into violating the margin, for example, here. And still, and still, this constraint would be satisfied. Is everyone following so far? Yep. Oh yeah. Oh, we're, we're gonna get to that right now. Okay, cool. So support vectors that violate the margin have a slack. They have to have a sl non-zero slack because, by definition, they're violating the margin. Uh, but the other points all have a slack of zero. Um. And so yeah, support vectors on the margin, they still have this equation hold because they have no slack. Um, and the key idea is we don't want these slacks like free roaming, right? We don't want these slacks like going to infinity and like, you know, like maybe like 10 or something. And like now all our equations are true, you know, just by coincidence. So we need to penalize these slack variables in some way. So this leads us to our new problem formulation. We have to minimize this norm of W squared plus the sum of these slacks with some penalty c. And c is something we can choose. So now we're, we're trying to minimize this total sum, which means we're minimizing the slacks as well with some penalty. And our constraints are, again, that y times wx plus b must be greater than 1 minus the slack. And you know our slack has to be non-negative. Does this make sense so far? So basically trying to limit the amount of slack there is. Um, so naturally, you know, if, if, if our program is trying to uh, minimize this term and a point is on the, on the margin or below it, correctly classified, it's going to set its slack to zero because that means it doesn't need to change w in any way and it can still set um, the slack to zero and satisfy this condition. Does it make sense? On the other hand, if 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 um, if our point is way off the line, then it'll say that reordering w to be something completely different is not worth it because we can just assign it some slack, and it's okay taking that penalty. And just that that trade-off is determined by c. So c here is our regularization hyperparameter. So it's something we control when we build the SVM. We tell it what we want c to be, and that's how much we penalize these slack variables. Any questions so far? OK, cool. So another way to rewrite this is um, since you know that your slack is not negative, you can kind of rewrite it as this max of 1 minus uh, y times wx plus b. Um, and this kind of gives us the final objective of this. Um, so here, we've completely removed the, any reference to the slack, and now we have this kind of regularization loss plus hinge loss. So a greater, a bigger parameter? Yeah, we're penalizing the slack more. Yeah. So yeah, so let's talk about this, right? So what we basically derived is that the solution to the SVM problem is essentially minimizing this term. So here, minimizing, this is basically, you can think of it as a regularization. Um, you know, the, the basic L2 regularization, but what it's really doing 
is it's trying to maximize the margin by minimizing the norm. Here, this is referred to as the hinge loss, um, which we'll see right here. So a max of 0 and 1 minus something looks like this blue line here. So what does this say? If y, if y times wx plus b is greater than 1, which means I'm correctly classified, right? If this part here is greater than 1, that means I'm correctly classified. So for that, I'm going to have 0 loss. Anything 1 or greater will have 0 loss. Does it make sense? Yeah, OK. Now, if I'm totally off, if y times wx or something is totally negative, right? Then I'm going to have this linear, like this linearly going loss up, up to infinity like this, right? Now suppose, what, so what does it mean if y times wx plus b is negative? That means I'm, that my prediction was the opposite class of what it should be, right? That means I'm basically on the other side of the hyperplane. So if I'm, if I'm the, on the other side of the hyperplane, I get this linearly scaling loss based on how, like, how far away I am from the hyperplane. And you notice one interesting, one interesting thing too. Suppose I'm like, suppose in a prediction my wx plus b is like 0.5, right? So I'm still on the right side of the hyperplane, but I'm not at 1, I'm at 0.5. Then I still have this small amount of loss seen over here. So basically, I'm going to be penalizing everything that's not completely, fully, correctly classified. By fully, I mean y times wx plus b equals 1. So this max of 0 and 1 minus x is basically represented with this hinge loss. So really, so really, like, we did all this derivation to come up with the SVM formulation. What it really boils down to is L2 regularization and hinge loss. And we're just trying to minimize that. And that's all the SVM is trying to do. Does everyone see how that kind of works? Any questions on that? Yeah. Hmm? Oh, W, um, W is our weights. So W times X plus B is our hyperplane. Um, and W and B are the weights that we control. So you can think of it as like linear regression, right? You have like some X vector and you multiply by some coefficients. So W is like basically represents our coefficients here. So in like a 2D case, it'd be like MX plus B and you get to control M and B. In like a multiple, mul like higher dimensional case, W and X are vectors. Okay, cool. So let's talk about solving the SVM. So we have this, right? Um, this is just some loss in terms of like some coefficients and our data points. So this is something we know how to do. We can just minimize this via gradient descent, right? This is something we already talked about. We can compute the gradient of this, you know, with respect to our weights and our biases and use gradient descent to solve it. But there's another way to look at this problem. Um, this might be a little like mathy, um, but this problem has something we can refer to it as a dual. So if you've taken CS70 or anything similar, um, you know that every, pro every problem called a primal has a dual. So, um, ma so maximizing the primal corresponds to minimizing the dual. So the way you can think of this is like, suppose you have some primal on this side, right? The primal is trying to maximize, so it's trying to grow to the grow max like maxwardsly, right, to the left. This primal problem has a dual, and the dual is always greater than the primal. And the dual problem you're trying to minimize. It. So simultaneously, your primal is trying to maximize, and your dual is trying to minimize, and they're going to meet in the middle. And that middle is at the optimal of both points because the dual is always greater than the primal. So the minimum of the dual equals the max of the primal. And both of these optimums equal each other. Not all the time, but in this in this case they do. Okay. So what's the, sorry, what's the yeah, exactly. Okay, so yeah, this sounds like hand wavy, but let's 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 look at it in terms we know, right? So the primal maximizing the margin. Right? This is what we already talked about. This is our primal formulation. 
Our dual is minimizing the distance between the convex hulls. OK, let's just look at a picture. So these are our data points. This is our, this is our hyperplane. These are our data points. A convex hull, you can just think of it as like some sort of like ball, just like wrapping around our data points. So here we have a ball here and a ball here, representing like the wraps of our two like clusters of data points. Right? So what is it saying? The, the dual is just maximizing the distance between these, uh, minimizing the distance between these convex hulls. So I could take a distance, you know, from like, from all the way here to here, but that wouldn't be the min minimum distance. The minimum distance would be right here. And trying to find the closest distance between these two convex hulls gives you a solution to the hyperplane. Um, and the way you can see that is that the min this minimum distance line kind of bisects the hyperplane. So our optimal, our primal was trying to find this max margin. So our primal was trying to like expand it out, to like expand out, maximize, and see until like where I can hit data points. Our dual is trying to look at these convex holes and trying to find the minimum distance between them. Okay, don't worry if you like don't fully understand that yet. Um, you don't need to like fully understand this interpretation for the next part. Okay. So we're going to do some derivations based on this dual. And um, let's assume that our data points are linearly separable, um, just to help us out. You can do this with slack variables as well, but it's easier if we just look at the case where all our data is linearly separable. OK. So we want to minimize this norm such that this holds for all support vectors. Um, so one thing you can do is you know, when you want to minimize something, you just take the derivative. Um, so uh, we can take the derivative of it um, and set it equal to zero and don't worry about this too much but essentially what we did in this step is that instead of having this constraint we kind of penalized it by a factor you can think of this as like a C right we're kind of penalizing how much we violate this by and then we take the derivative uh, with respect to W and we set it equal to zero um, so we get some answer for W, and we do the same thing for B. Okay, I don't want to explain this math, um, so just know that like you can do this. Okay, so we know there's an extreme at W equals you know the sum of these AI, YI, XI. So we can just take that and use our equation and plug it back in, and then we do some more substitution and solving, and we get this answer. Can anyone tell me what's special about this? Just by looking at it. You don't have to know anything like mathematically intuitive or anything. Just by looking at it. Uh, yeah, just shout it out if you know or don't know or want to guess. OK, no, I heard. I didn't. Uh, OK. Okay, I didn't, I didn't hear anyone say it, but okay, so let's just, let's just look at it. So, okay, this is a loss. So the key here is that our optimization problem depends on the dot product of our data points. So our data points here, x and xi and xj, they're not being used in anywhere else in this loss, in this loss term. We're only doing the dot product of these data points with, with each other and, and some of the, in like the sum or whatever. So this is the key. And this is what's going to unlock some really cool properties of SBMs, of SBMs. The fact that you can express this as a doc product. OK, so that leads us into our discussion about kernels. So many times our data is highly nonlinear, right? So in this case, you know, we talked about adding, adding slack variables when we have some noise in the data. But you know, for example, if your data is like a circle, that slack variables are not really going to do much, right? They're only really effective for like noise or outliers. What we need is some sort of way to represent this data in a different way. So the key idea here is we want to transform our data into a higher dimensional space. So let's see what that looks like. So suppose, suppose all our points are on this line, right? Say this is like x1, x2, x3, 4, 5, etc. right? Does that make sense? This is our 1D case. 
all our points lie on this one dimensional line. Now, what if I apply a transformation x minus 5 to all square? I'm applying this transformation of x minus 5 squared. What does that mean? What does that look like? That means my, now, my, now my data points look like this, right? At x minus 5, that's 0. That's over here. x minus 4 and x minus 3 lie like over here at 1. And all the other points are above it, right? Because they get further and away, further and away from 5. Now, now my points are linearly separable, right? I just draw this horizontal line. Boom, I got, you know, I got the answer. So what does it say? In this 1D case, in this lower dimensional case, there's no line that I can draw that will separate these two classes. But I can lift this into a higher dimensional space. Here, I did some like x minus 5 squared, so some like polynomial transformation to get it into this higher dimensional space. And now in this higher dimensional space, I was able to classify it linearly. Does anyone have any questions on this like simple example? Yep. Yeah, yeah, it's possible. So yeah, you can compute like polynomial degrees of two, three, four, five, etc., and even more. Like in like always. Um, so, so you're asking if it's possible to find a linear decision boundary in a higher dimensional space? Um, so I don't know if that's like always, always true, but it's like a widely used practice. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to use some notation here. So let phi of x uh, be the transformation into this higher space. So for the simple case, x here is just a scalar. So for example, where it lies on this number line. And our phi of x will be x minus 5 squared. That's our transformation. So this transformation lifts this 1D into this 2D plot. Does this make sense? OK, cool. So going back to where we had it, right? So we saw that a loss only depended on xi and xj. So suppose now, OK, now we say, OK, we want to lift this into some higher dimensional space because our data is nonlinear. So let's lift this into some higher dimensional space just like we did here so we can uh, classify it better, right? So let's apply this transformation phi, right? Some phi, some transformation that lifts into a higher dimensional space. So now we replace phi of xi and phi of xj and we get something like this. Yep. Oh, um, so they come from the derivation of this dual. So, like, it's just like once we look at the dual and we like figure out what the loss is, x and x are like our data points. They're our training points. So yeah, basically our loss is now only in terms of like x and x j here. So and these are like looping through all coordinates of i and j. So basically, this is saying we're we're gonna scale like we're gonna look at every point and dot product it with every other point, and then we're going to scale it by whatever this is. Does that make sense? OK, cool. Um, yeah, so, so now we get this, right? We're just applying this transformation to our data points. So what the kernel is saying is that the kernel is some way that we can efficiently represent this dot product in a higher dimensional space. So this is going to sound abstract for now, but I'm just going to call this kernel, this k of xi and xj, equal to the dot product between these two phi's. <laughs> don't worry if you don't know what this means yet, we'll get to it. Um, so yeah, the kernel will have some special properties that allow this computation to be really easy. And now, once I define the kernel to be this, I can just plug in the kernel here. And now my new loss looks like that. Okay, let's, let's look at an example, um, just to make this all clear. So suppose this is my x, right? My x is some point in two dimensions, x1 and x2. My y is some point in two dimensions. Um, so x and y are going to be my two training points here. So y is not, y is not the prediction. Y is my, another training point. So just as we had xi and xj, this is going to be x and y, OK? So here, x is these two points, is uh, x1 and x2, and y is this vector of y1 and y2. Um, and now we want to lift this using 
into a, a polynomial degree 2 space, right? So basically, we're going to compute all the polynomial features of x, y, of x and y. So what would this generally look like, right? This look like, for x, this will look like some constant offset plus x. Uh, there's going to be a term for x1, a term for x2, a term for x1 squared, x2 squared, and x1, x2. So for x, it's going to look something like this. We're going to have a constant offset, a bias, and then we're going to have x1 squared, x2 squared, and then the x1s, the x1, x2, and then x1, x2 here multiplied together. So these are, this is like our terms of degree 2, our terms of degree, uh, this is a term of degree 2, and these are terms of degree 1, and this is a term of degree 0. This is kind of makes sense. Don't worry about why there's like this square root 2 out front. Just like trust for now. Okay, does, does everyone kind of remember we did this like polynomial regression during the linear regression lecture? So it like kind of makes sense, right? We have like all the features of degree two, all the features of degree one, features of degree zero. Cool, so we can do the same thing for y. So one key thing to note here, right? We're just lifting this from a, uh, from a, from a one dimensional, from a polynomial degree one to polynomial degree two. And in that, our, our vector got so long, right? We have a lot more entries in our vector, just to note. Okay. So now let's compute the dot product between x, uh, between 5x and 5y. So, okay, let's take it step by step, right? So 5x and 5y is just, this is just the vector for x times the vector for y, right? Just focus on these two parts first. Just the vector for x times the vector of y. That's all we're doing. Now, so there are a bunch of cross terms, so we can foil it out and we get something that looks like this. We can use complete the square, and we get something that looks like this. And we simplify more. x1 plus x1 y1 plus x2 y2 is just the dot product between x and y. So that looks like this. And that equals our kernel. OK, that was a lot of math. Let's just recap what we did, right? We wanted to transform our initial data points, x and y, into some higher dimensional polynomial space. We did that. We found these vectors. We computed the dot product like we were supposed to. And we got that it like simplifies to this weirdly nice formula for some reason. And that formula is exactly the polynomial kernel. So the polynomial kernel basically gives you a really efficient way to represent the dot product of two uh, training points in a really high polynomial dimension. So we derived here the case for a polynomial degree equals two, right? But in general, the polynomial kernel is basically one plus the inner product between the original training points raised to the pth power. So for example, if my polynomial kernel is degree two, that's just one plus x of x y squared. So what is this saying, right? Basically, all right, let me, let me back up. So we have here this loss. We can either explicitly featureize x, xi, and xj, and, and get this, or we can directly use the kernel, right? So we can explicitly featureize it, do all these calculations, or we can just plug this in. And they're roughly equivalent up to these like constant factor degrees. That's all that's important. So what's like the importance of this, right? So computing degree p features of a d-dimensional input takes roughly order d to the p time. So here, this is just two-dimensional and two um, and degree two. And that already made the vector like pretty long. So in general, like doing this full transformation of 5x for polynomials, we'll take like order of d to the p time, which is exponential. But the kernel, on the other hand, is literally just this dot product, and you're just raising it to the power. The kernel can be computed in order of d time. Why? Because it's literally, it's literally just the dot product between these two these uh, these two uh, data points in the original feature space. 
You're taking the dot product in the original feature space, and then you're lifting up to a high dimension. So even if these vectors have length, like order of d to the p, the polynomial kernel works in order of d time. So this is like magic, right? We just showed that like an exponential operation becomes like roughly linear, which is like pretty crazy. Uh, okay, so like technically, like when you're doing this like um, raising to the power, that takes some like time proportional to p, um, and you can use like um, iterated squaring to get it in like log p time. Okay, cool. So let's just like watch a cool little demo. So here we have our data points, right? So here, um, basically everything outside this ring is is uh, red. Everything inside is blue. So in this two D, in this two D space, we can't really distinguish red and blue with just a linear boundary, right? But now what we're going to do is we're going to use a polynomial degree uh, three feature. I'm going to raise it into this three dimensional space. So now it kind of looks like this parabola with the blue points grouped on the bottom and the red points up on top. And now we can just classify it with this hyperplane in three dimensions or plane. And we have a linear decision boundary. Did everyone see how that kind of works? Do you guys want me to play it again or no? Yes for again, down for no. You want a what? Oh, That's a hyperparameter you choose. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah. So that's typically like, like, are you asking like, what power do we determine, like, how much to raise it to? Not necessarily just the power. Like, you could raise it to a second degree polynomial, for example, but like, you could raise it Right. Right, so like how exactly like how exactly compute this like transformation? That's like a hyperparameter. So like what degree polynomial, like what feature space, that's all like a hyperparameter. Yep. So that's just you doing it over and over and Like why polynomial degree features work? Like why like which one you should choose in the first place. Oh, we just that's use cross validation for that. Right. You might have some intuition, but the best way is like cross validation. Okay, so just to recap, if you like were inundated with the math, that's okay. All I want you to take out of this is that we took something that took exponential time and made it linear with the power of kernels. And that was only possible because the kernels depend on the dot products. And we have a really efficient way to represent that because of algebra. Okay. Okay. So that was pretty cool, right? We just took like an exponential thing and made it like linear rhythmic. Now I'm going to show you something even more insane. Okay, so recall the Gaussian, right? This is like the formula for the Gaussian. It's like exponential of like, you know, this, this thing. Um, so if you look at it, right, like mu is like our mean, um, and x is like a sample data point. So what this is really measuring is like how close you are to the sample data point. So like if you're really far away, that means this square term will be really big, and then e to the negative something really big will be zero. Like, or like close to zero. So if you're really far away from your mean, or you're really dissimilar from your mean, that means this overall score is going to be really low. But if you're really close to the mean, then like for example, if you're mu itself, then you're going to be e to the zero, which is one. So this is this can be thought of like you know like as a representation of like how close you are to the mean. So here we have like a two D Gaussian, and this mean lies at I think zero zero right here, right? So we're looking at basically all these points, we're looking at how far away are they from the mean. And based on this exponential formula, we're going to plot it. So the points right nearest to the mean have the highest probability, right? They have like, or they have the highest like um, score. They have a score of like one pretty much. And the further away you get from the mean, um, the, the more it dies down. And just how much, just how sharp this peak is, is determined by that sigma parameter, but we'll get to that later. Okay, so suppose like you wanted to compute, you wanted to raise your features 
to a Gaussian feature space. Does anyone know what the transformation would be in this case? You wanted to take your singular data point and raise it to this Gaussian feature space. Oh, this function here. So, um, so for this function, we need two things, right? We need an x and a mu. So we have the x, but what's the mu? So what's what would the center be? Well, like zero is like pretty arbitrary, right? It's a tough question. It's a tough question. So, okay, so the real answer is, like, suppose you're trying to lift our phi, like, create this phi, right, that represents this Gaussian. What we really have, we, we can think of it this way, right? We really have this center point, right? We're trying to f figure out how other points are, how they compare to x. How close are other points to x? So what we really have is this mu. And we're trying to figure out how close are all other points to this x. Yeah, exactly, right? So literally, we have to use this Gaussian and evaluate it at every single point yeah. around this Gaussian to figure it out. So in this case, we have to evaluate the Gaussian at infinitely many points just to compute this phi of x. Does it make sense? Because this should represent how close a point is to x, right? For, for a polynomial case, this is really easy because we just raise it to the second degree power or something, right? But for this x, we're trying to find how close all, like every point is to this x. And since Gaussian is like a continuous thing, right? It runs in continuous space. We have to literally do it like infinitely many points to get all the points sampled across, you know, this mount, this mount. Because this mount represents just one data point. So our phi of x would literally have to be an infinitely long vector. Okay. What happens if you kernelize it? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> so the kernel of our two data points is just this, right? It's just the difference squared over two sigma, like exponent of that. It's just their distance under the Gaussian. So like the dot product of two infinitely like long or like infinite vectors is just this one like simple formula. That, yeah, that's just, that just holds. Right? Yeah. Uh, that's like a hyperparameter that you play with. Yeah. So yeah, so this is so cool, right? We just showed that like going to like trying to featureize this is intractable because it requires infinitely many points or infinite, like an infinitely long vector. But instead, if we use kernels, we can just get this like one single computation. Uh, it's like not that hard. It requires some real analysis. So yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about a bit about it more. So basically, the Gaussian kernel of two points x and y um, is just basically the difference under the Gaussian. So we can represent this two sigma squared here as we can just collapse it into another thing called gamma, right? So gamma here 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 would be a hyperparameter. So for example, here these, these Gaussians all lie on the mean, but they have different standard deviations. So the smaller your standard deviation, um, the smaller, like the sharper your peak. Uh, but for gamma, it's the opposite way around, opposite way around. So the smaller your standard deviation, or the smaller your variance, or your sigma squared, the bigger your um, gamma. It's like an inversely rela inverse relationship. Does everyone see that? Okay, cool. So remember, phi of x is like an infinite vector, but we can actually show that the dot product of phi of x and phi of y converges to this kernel of x and y. Um, and yeah, so a large gamma basically means a small variance, which means that if we have a small variance, we have a lot of peaks of where these data points are, right? So if you have a lot of like really tiny peaks, that encourages high variance and a low bias estimate. We'll talk about more about this bias and variance later on, so don't be, don't try and like internalize what gamma is right now, just like try and internalize this thing. Okay, any questions on any part? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, oh, this gamma? Five x five y. Um, like, what does it converge to? Oh, it converges to this kernel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, right? We have we can use this gaussian as like a similarity function. So the kernel of x and y assigns a high value for points that are near each other, right? We saw that already. So if points are really near each other, then it'll assign it really a high value. Does that kind of make sense? Does everyone like kind of follow along at how this like Gaussian kernel can measure similarity with the distance between x and x and y or x and mu? Any questions? Okay, cool. So let's pause for a second and take a step back, right? What did we just show? So we showed that kernels can essentially compute dot products between infinitely long vectors or infinite vectors. So we can further show, and this requires some, some more math, but we can further show that the dot product of any infinitely, infinitely infinite dimensional representation can be represented by these really efficient kernels. So any infinite dimensional representation you can think of can be represented by kernels. And any loss function operating on these infinite dimensional spaces can be equivalently, equivalently reduced to a loss operated on these kernelized dot products. So what are we saying? We're saying that kernels are an arbitrary, arbitrarily close approximation to infinite dimensional feature spaces. Yeah, holy grail. So the conclusion is that kernels have literally limitless power. OK, what does this mean? Kernels have limitless power. Then why do we use neural nets? Right? If kernels are so great, why do we use neural nets? Exactly. Very good point. One very good point, right? In kernels, we have to compute exactly. We have to figure out what this kernelized function is. Neural nets, we just like throw in some nodes and call it a day, right? So yeah, kernels are very sensitive to like what uh, function you use to compute the kernelized product. But there's like one more fundamental reason. Yep. Exactly, right? So our kernels, remember, they were the dot products of our data points. So if we have n data points, we have to compute n squared kernel entries. So kernels grow on the order of our data points. But neural networks just get more complex on the order of our parameters. And you know, typically, in most cases, the number of data points is much bigger than the number of parameters. But like, like. Kernels are so so expressive. Like before neural nets, neural nets became a thing like 2010, like all the research was on like kernels. And like kernels were considered like the holy grail, you know, like they could do anything, they could have like, you know, this expressive power, they could represent anything. And there was like a bunch of research done on kernels. And you know, all of that changed when you know neural nets started picking up in popularity. And the reason is because, you know, because of this. Because neural networks don't depend on the number of data points or don't grow on the order of number of data points, what kernels do. Yep. Yeah, you can back, yeah. A kernel is just a function, right? So yeah, you can definitely back propagate. Yep. Um, well, I think, I think there's like a, like a little finer point there, but like like technically O of n is O of n squared, but like uh, there's like a little finer point that yeah I didn't want to like touch on, but you, you it's just like it's kind of irrelevant, but yeah you, you're kind of right. Uh, it's like it's not like strict. It's like somewhere between like it, it requires a much longer discussion than like we can talk about it later. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, cool. So, um, why do we use Gaussian kernels? So, ga like, RBF kernels or Gaussian kernels, they're, like, really popular, right? Um, so, why do we use them? So, one, they can give us a smooth decision function. So, for example, like, because it's continuous, um, it gives us a really smooth function. Um, and it kind of behaves like a really smooth k, k nearest neighbors because you're kind of computing the similarities between your, um, your training points. So in, in like nearest neighbors, you're looking at, you know, what's, what's the, what are the neighbors most similar to me, the nearest to me. Um, this is kind of doing the same thing. Cur um, and these Gaussian kernels oscillate less than polynomials, cur uh, polynomials do. Uh, and this kind of like depends on your value of sigma or your gamma hyperparameter. Uh, but typically, if you choose it to be broad enough, then it has a less oscillation than polynomial kernels. Um, and like one reason why it might be more effective is that points closer to z or points closer to the mean, closer to the mean have a greater impact on the final prediction. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so we're gonna take like a five minute break, and we're gonna do attendance. And then, yeah, and then we'll continue on. Okay. What's the attendance link? Yeah. I'm gonna like this song. <laughs> what is it? You make the text bigger. All right, all right. So it's. Uh... Hey, what's up? Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, could you either ask Nikita or Danny? Or Thank you. Yep. <laughs> no, why? <laughs> God. I hate putting this up. Oh yeah, if, every, if, everyone, if every, everyone can pull from GitHub as well, um, there's like a demo notebook there, we're going to go through that. Your axis is a 
Yeah, what's up? I love, I love the URL. <laughs> this is my favorite URL. This is my most Wait, favorite. Wait, should I get started? I have kind of a lot to cover. Huh? Wait, I have hold on. A lot to cover. Do you think I should just skim over the demo? Wait, I have stuff to go over. You do? Yeah. What do you have to go over? Um, this. What is that? Oh, okay. Do it now. Do it now. Oh, do you want the HDMI? No, it's fine. I'll send it to you. Oh, okay. Do what? Slack? Yeah. Oh. Um, Slack. I'll just Slack into you. Slack, 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 Slack. Computer. Shit, I just showed Hamza sleeping with everyone. <laughs> Alright, cool. We're good. Alright, you send an EDU. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, wait, of course I send it to you. EDU. <laughs> um, wait, actually, where, where the, where's the... Crap. What do you want? How do you get to the education drive? Oh, one sec. Or I just want to go to the attendance. Wow. I forgot you could have bookmarks. <laughs> 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 Is EDU's folder fam. Oh my god, what's wrong with your computer? Dude, that's on you, it's not on me. <laughs> this, is, this is on you! <laughs> oh god. 
Hopefully you don't show anything sensitive, right? One twenty-two. All right. <laughs> You'll find out. All right. Okay, bring it, bring it back in, guys. Uh, <laughs> it is Rohan is cute six. Rohan is cute was already taken for some reason. Why was that cute? <laughs> Probably from last semester. You're very cute. Um, no, yeah. So um, last week we asked you guys to guess how many how many chocolate chips were in this Crossroads cup. So you get a side view, and you get a top view. And so this was the result. Um, so the actual number of chocolate chips in the cup was 246, which is somewhere around here, which, um, I guess it's all right. The average was like 150. And then if you took out like some guy, some, somebody gets like a thousand and somebody gets 800. <laughs> and so if you took those two out, the average was even lower. It was like 137 or something. So, um. I guess you guys are just really bad at this. Um, I, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed. <laughs> I, I really wanted this to be like a bell curve around 250. But, oh well, I guess um, it goes to show that like data you collect in the real world is actually pretty crappy. And um, yeah, let's see. So we had, we had a four-way tie for the closest guess. Uh, four people guessed 250. And if that was you, or if you don't remember, at the end of class, we'll put up your names on the uh, projector. You guys can go, come up here and get some candy. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all. Wait, what kind of candy? Uh, Reese's Cups and uh, Kit Kats. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, if everyone can open up the, the SVM Demo Student Notebook. <laughs> Who would guess a thousand? <laughs> 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 Sorry, if that was you. Please don't take any offense. Okay, cool. Um, so let's do a let's do a little demo of SVMs, and uh, hopefully by this you can see how like the different hyperparameters can affect um, can affect your data and can affect your predictions. So, everyone got it up? Everyone good? Okay, cool. So we're just gonna do some imports. Um, and then this data, so this should all be in the same directory, so you should all already have this data in here, so. Um, so let's look at this raw data. So, right, let me zoom in. Can you guys see this now? If you can't see it, put your thumbs down. Okay, cool. So here our X is like this 2D, um, is this two-dimensional data point? Are these two-dimensional data points? So some x1 and some x2, um, and then our y's are like zero or one. So we have a bunch of ones and then a bunch of zeros. Um, so let's uh, yeah. So let's uh, visual let's visualize our data so we can take a better look at it. So we have something like this. So um, it's very similar to the data that we saw earlier in lecture, but there's this one little tricky boy out here. That's good. That's uh, or girl, you know, tricky, tricky thing. Uh, no, not that humans are. Okay, no, never mind. So we have this one little tricky data point out there. Um, that's uh, that's gonna kind of screw this a little bit. So let's see how that impacts us. Um, but yeah, generally, generally uh, our data looks pretty okay. So just to recap, right? How to choose our hyperparameter C. So C, if you remember, is how much we penalize those slack variables. So if we have a large C, that means we're penalizing the slack a lot. That means we're not having a lot of slack. So large C is similar to a hard margin, where we have no slack. Um, and the goal is to just miscla misclassify a few training points. So this can often be very sensitive to outliers, because outliers don't have that slack anymore. So your margin will try to bend itself over to try and like accommodate those, uh, those points. So with a large C, you have this like risk of overfitting to your outliers. Um, a small C, it kind of maximizes the margin at the cost of misclassifying these, misclassifying these training points. So what the, the risk of a small C is 
that um, you could underfit. You, you won't be able to learn like the optimal boundary, basically, um, because you're letting too many points be misclassified. So we, try to, we generally want to figure out what this best C is. Okay, cool. So um, let's build the SVM here. So all the uh, so what we're gonna do is from sk learn import sv svm um, and then we're gonna construct our svc so svc equals sv dot so here I'm not gonna use any kernel I'm just gonna do the linear case so linear svc um, and I'm gonna set c equal to one there's just an arbitrary choice of hyperparameter for now uh, and we're gonna do loss equals hinge and max iter equals 1000 and we're just going to print out our svc so this is what it looks like so it gives us linear svc and tells us a bunch of parameters okay now we want to fit our data and test on it so what we're going to do is svc.fit um uh, data bracket bracket x1 comma x2 data y so we're going to fit on it and then oops we're going to do svc.score so this tells us that we got about 98% accuracy so we can tell, you know, since we have relatively few points, we can probably tell that we misclassified that point out there, right? Okay, so, you know, maybe this is not a bad thing, right? Maybe we want to misclassify because it's like an outline. So let's try and see what happens if we do the other end, right? So let's try a really huge value of C. So uh, I'm just going to copy this code. So I'm going to set C equal to like 100, or 1,000 actually. Let's just make it really big. Uh, let's just say max id equals 5,000. And uh, let's do the same fit and score. OK, so we got like like 98%. Um, so it's like similar. Um, but like let's see if like okay for, from now it seems like all right we got like the same score you know maybe our model is similar let's try and plot it and see what our model is really doing so if we move down to this cell here um let's just run it at first so it's going to show us basically our decision confidence right so oh oops what happened so the more confident points here uh let me just do this okay so the more confident we are under points, the darker it's going to be. So as you can see, our boundary is like over here somewhere, right? And we have these points be kind of soft because they're kind of near the margin. But the further away we go, they get darker and darker to show our confidence. So let's, let's this is kind of arbitrary. Let's visualize our confidence boundary more. So um, if you remember, right, like in this case, so one, one thing we can do is like svc.coif and svc dot intercept I believe so basically this will give us the coefficients um, and the intercept of our of our classifier so this is our w vector over here and this is our intercept right so if we rem recall the equation of the hyperplane right that's going to be basically um, svc you don't have to write this down I'm just going to show you this svc uh, zero times our like data one plus uh, data x two plus okay so this is basically this is basically the equation of our line right we have our don't worry about this double indexing it's just like getting this zero element this is w1 times x1 plus w2 times x2 plus our intercept. That's basically wx plus b. That's kind of a line, right? Does everyone follow that? Oh, oops. Uh, 
Okay, I didn't want to do that, but okay, that's kind of our line. So what we want to do is we want to plot this line down below. So what we're going to do is here, we're going to do plt.plot, and our x dimension is still going to be the x. Um, but now uh, we want to like find x2 in terms of this equation that we have up here. So um, essentially that turns into negative SVC. You can like basically set it equal to zero, move it to the other side, and solve for W2. That's what I'm doing here. Um, SVC dot coef zero, uh, zero. Oh, hold on. Zero, zero times data x1 plus SVC dot intercept zero parentheses over SVC dot coif zero one and let's just say C equals green okay so this basically comes from the the equation of the line we did above we just did it went in and solved for coef zero one which is in this case is w2 so if we plot that um, this becomes our decision boundary. So we can see that like a fairly good job, right? Okay, cool. Now let's do it for the other one as well. Don't worry if you're not like totally following along with the code. I'll, I'll post the solutions later. But um, basically, we'll do the same thing for the one below here. We're going to visualize this boundary. And so we're going to do SVC2, SVC2, SVC2. Uh, oh, what was it called? Um, oh, wait, that makes Okay, hold on. Uh, Wait, change these to SVC2. Okay. Okay, wait, so let me recap. Okay, so the first the first one you constructed with C equals one, we're just gonna call that SVC. Okay. Now the second one, we're gonna rename that to SVC2. Okay. Now when we go down here and we visualize it, that's our decision boundary. So that makes more sense, right? So this is like a pretty good, like, so when C equals one, this is our decision line. So this looks pretty good, right? It's like pretty good, like in the, in the middle, you know, expected like this one data point, like misclassified, but you know, maybe that's okay. Cause it's like an outlier and we don't want to risk changing it for our decision line. So when you do the same thing for SVC two, we'll get this really whack decision line, right? It's like unnecessarily close to the blue just because that one, uh, Point over there was moving moving the line a lot. Yeah, so you ideally you should run it for more iterations, but just, this is just demo, so it's like a little a little variance in the estimate. Um, but yeah, so does everyone see like when C equals one, that means we didn't penalize the slack as much, so we allowed the slack to go out. Now we set C to like some really high number, like a thousand, and we said, okay, we're not going to allow you to give that much slack. So the margin had to move over to accommodate it. And what happened as a result of that moving? We saw that the line is not evenly balanced between the classes now. It's much closer to the blue. All these confidence, confidence scores are much lighter, much lower than the ones up here. Does everyone see that? Okay, cool. Now this is like, you know, we, seen, we saw SVC in like a linear data set, but I just talked about kernels and how they're so great. So we have to see something like that's really cool, right? Okay, so we're gonna see this insanely nonlinear data set, which looks like this. And yeah, it's just a bunch of like curves everywhere. So let's see if SVC can really handle this. Okay. So we're gonna build the SVM. Uh, so we're gonna do SVC equals svm.svc. So notice we're not using linear in this case. 
We're gonna see equals to 100, gamma equals 10. So remember here, gamma is that hyperparameter that we talked about that kind of controls the variance of your estimate. So big gamma means, or like a larger gamma means a smaller standard deviation, which means higher variance. And probability equals true. So we construct our SVC. Um, and then we're going to do svc.fit data x1, x2, y, oh, data y. I'm going to do the same thing for the score. So we saw that, okay, it got about 97% accuracy. So let's kind of visualize it. So that's what it looks like. So if gamma equals 10, we saw, okay, it got most of the points, but like, there's some points here that are misclassified. These ones here, these ones here, these ones here, right? So what I want to do is I want to get the best accuracy that I can. So, you know, I can go up here and like play around with the fiddle around with a bunch of values of gamma, but that's not what I've learned to do, right? We learned about this tool called, called cross-validation. Okay, so let's do cross-validation. So what we're going to do is import this thing called grid search, which is really useful, and I'll show you what it does. So we're just going to call this, just define a method, des svc from selection x, y, and folds. Uh, I'm going to set, I'm going to loop over a bunch of these c's. So typically I want them like orders of magnitude apart. Uh, comma grid search, grid underscore search, yeah. 10, 100, 1,000, uh, oh, oh yeah, 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 you're right, okay. And then, gammas are going to be something similar, but I don't need to do all the way 1,000, okay. And we're going to construct this, basically, I'm specifying what values of C and gamma do I want to loop over. And I'm going to construct this param grid, which is basically this dictionary, so C plus C's, and gamma equals gammas. And now I'm going to do a search. So now, now this is pretty cool. So grid search, we can do a grid search and construct a grid search CV which will search across all these grid of parameters. So for each C, it'll test every gamma, and et cetera. And it'll do cross-validation at the same time. So it's going to do this grid search CV, and then we can pass in a model that we want. So we can pass in svm.svc with the kernel equal to RBF. RBF is the Gaussian kernel. Um, and then we pass it the param grid, and then CV equals n folds. So n folds is basically how many, like, an n fold cross validation, how many folds do we want? Then we're going to do search.fit to our x and y data. Uh, and then we're going to do search.best. So search.best params will print out the best params at the end of the search. And then we can return this search.best params. Okay, so now we can run this cell here, and it'll do parameter selection, and it tells us, okay, the best ones are C is 10 and gamma is 100. So we can construct an SVC with C equals 10, gamma equals 100, fit it to the data. Now we see, wow, we get like 99.6% accuracy. And then we can visualize it. And we see that we pretty much got everything right. There's like one point over here that we missed. But other than that, we got everything right. Yep, that's pretty cool, right? So just using this Gaussian kernel, because it's so expressive and so powerful, we, will, we were able to learn this really high, highly nonlinear data set that looks like you know garbage toss in 2D. Any questions on this? I'll post the code after class so you guys can take a look as well. Oh, I, I could. It doesn't really matter. It was like, yeah, I. Just like 
I guess I kind of knew that like my optimal yeah, value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, like typically like search over any range that you think your parameters will be in. Um, so typically like one key thing to remember is that typically we do this like search over orders of magnitude. So you don't you don't just want to search like you know from the range like you know I don't know negative hundred to hundred. You want to search like orders of magnitude wise, um, and that will give you like from there you can figure out roughly where your gammas and c's lie, and then you can narrow it down. So you kind of want to do this coarse search and then finer finer search after. Okay, cool. So that was really cool. Um, let's go back to lecture and finish up the last few things. So now we're just going to talk about like in practice implementation what you need to worry about. So the SVC, like in general, it picks this optimal hyperplane. Um, so this allows the model to generalize pretty well. It's not as sensitive to outliers and overfitting as like neural networks, but it's still it's still an issue. You, sh you should still use cross validation. And these kernel functions allow for really efficient com computation of nonlinear features. That's in summary of like what we've learned today. So the pros are that it finds this optimal decision boundary, and it can co capture this like really complex relationship between the data, um, and it's like way more efficient than like manu manually calculating out these features individually. Um, the cons are that these like really high dimensional features take a really long time, and like you know this like data transformation boundary kernel trick is like kind of hard to interpret. So that's why SDMs are kind of like treated as a black box. They're still more interpretable than like neural networks, but um, it's like really hard to see what's going on in these like really complex kernel functions. So like they can be pretty challenging to implement from scratch. So it's better to know like how do you like how do you use an SDM rather than like how to know to code, code it from scratch. So yeah, just to recap, like this is like a soft margin SDM formulation. And the C represents is like how it's unacceptable it is to misclassify training points. So our hyperparameters, right? For C, if we have a large C, that's similar to having a hard margin. So this results in really small margins because you want to make sure all your points are correct. And so this is like really over, like sensitive to outliers and risks overfitting. On the other hand, the small C um, it has a cost of like misclassifying these training points, so it has a risk of underfitting. On kind of on the flip side. For gamma, right? These applies to some kernels. So the gamma applies to polynomial, RBF, and sigmoid kernels in SKLearn. So a small gamma. So the small gamma means you have a large variance in the RBF kernel. So each each support vector has a really large influence on, on like a class of points far away. So this means it has low variance because each point has a really far reach. So this leads to like high bias but low variance estimates. So you could risk underfitting with a small gamma. With a large gamma, that means you have really peaky points at each at each training point. So if like a bunch of these really small peaks all over the place, this can lead to really high, like really highly variant, or like a really high variance decision boundary, a really high variance model. Um, on the flip side, this can lead to low variance because your model is getting more complex. So with this large gamma, you have a risk of overfitting. Okay, so yeah, we did the SPM demo. Okay, cool. Now we're just gonna talk about like generally like ML algorithms and how to debug them. So any questions on like SVM so far? Okay, cool. So um, here's a problem, right? Our classifier has a test error that's too high. Does anyone know like, so we're gonna basically like do a bunch of like case studies of, like common problems and see if you guys can answer them. So what happens if my classifier has a test error that's too high, what should I do? Anyone? Yeah. Maybe allow it to be more expressive. Yeah, more expressive, right? So you can check if the classifier is overfitting or underfitting. Um, so basically, like, if our tester is too high, we don't know whether it's underfitting or overfitting. So just to like visualize this, right? If I have high bias, that means my model is not complex enough. This is like a balanced model. It's pretty nice. But if I have high variance. That means that my model is overfitting the noise. There's like a bunch of noise in these data points and I'm overfitting that noise. Why would that be test error that's too high? Uh, that's exactly what I'll show you right now. Okay, so here, this is a model of our error over time, uh, over model complexity. So on the x-axis is model complexity. So here to the right, my model is getting more complex. 
And here, this is test error. I mean, this is error, prediction error. So this green line here is training error. And this red line is test error. So the key thing to note here is that training error is always less than your test error. Because your model will always do better on data it has seen than data it hasn't. Training error will also, um, so yeah, okay. So training error will also only always decrease. Training error will never increase with model complexity. And the reason is that if your model gets more complex, you will never increase your bias, right? Because we talked about like if your model is more complex, it can always set those features to zero that it doesn't need. So adding more features and more complexity to your model is never a good thing in terms of bias. But increasing complexity, like in this case, this is super complex decision boundary, it can increase variance. So increasing model complexity reduces bias, but increases variance. So what? The, so really what this is capturing is that this training error only represents the bias. This is why it only decreases with model complexity. Because as model complexity increases, we are decreasing our bias. Tra so training error only represents our bias. The test error, on the other hand, is data that it, that it hasn't seen. So test error represents both bias and variance. Why? Because if we're overfitting the noise in our training set, that noise is not the same in our test set. So if we overfit to the variance or the noise, then our model, then our test error will start to increase. So our test error kind of looks like this like parabola, right? So if we go too far to the left, if our model is not complex enough, we're underfitting, we're not expressive enough. On the, other hand, on the other hand, if it's too expressive, if it has like too many like small like features or like, you know, like too many extra things and it's too overly complex, it'll risk overfitting because it'll fit to the noise rather than the actual data. So we really want to find this optimum here because we want to find the model that generalizes the best. So yeah, there's like some minimum point to this trade-off and we use basically cross-validation to figure this out. Okay, now we have like four problems here. I want you to like just shout out hi, uh, which one, like these are like four fixes to, different, to either high bias or high variance. So I just want to shout out like which one of these will fix. So will obtaining more training samples fix bias or variance? Variance, right, exactly. Because with, uh, with more training samples, you have a better estimate of what the function is so that reduces the noise, kind of averaging out the noise. Reducing the number of features, what will that fix? Right? Reducing number of features fix, fixes variance. Why? Because the number of features doesn't really matter for bias. Bias can always set it to zero if it doesn't need it. Right? So you're not really biasing your model by adding extra features. You're increasing the variance because that's more chances of noise to leak into your prediction. Increasing the number of features, what will that, will that fix? Bias, right? You want your model to be more expressive. And using regularization, will not fix. Variance, yeah, exactly. So reg the whole idea of regularization is to add a little bit of bias to your model to decrease variance. Okay. Um, let's skip this. Okay, just a quick little last thing um, in applying your ML algorithm. So when using like an ML algorithm, there are like various components of your architecture. So you should be able to like put each into a little black box and design them as separate components. So the benefit is that this allows for like more, a more scalable algorithm and you can fine tune each box as you see fit without breaking the whole chain. The issue here is that it's harder to understand or like predict the design for each component and it's hard to understand like what the components actually should be and how you should like um, separate them. So you should often like try to come up with a quick implementation and then optimize. So the benefit is that like, you know, the application will work more quickly and time is only spent on components that are broken. So let's like do a case study, right? So we have this like face recognition example. So what's our, our pipeline is we get this image, we're gonna pre-process the data, and then we're gonna do some face detection, right? So that face detection will break them into like eye segmentation, nose segmentation, mouth segmentation, and then finally we'll combine it all into a, a logistic regression and that'll produce a label. So this is like a model pipeline. So let's do some error analysis, right? So 
we want to figure out, like, we've got these black boxes for each step. We want to figure out, like, how good is each box? Now, it's kind of tough to isolate, like, you know, just this one box from the whole system, right? If you just, if you just look at the input and output, it's kind of hard to know if something went wrong, like, which box was it, right? So the way we do this is we feed in the true inputs and the outputs for each box and kind of isolate it and test it in its own environment and see how well it's doing. So we basically plug in, plug in the true values as input to each component and see how that affects accuracy. So for example, our overall system is accuracy like 85%, right? And you see that these individual boxes in our pipeline have an accuracy of this much, right? We can deduce that we have like most room for improvement in our eye segmentation part uh, right here, because that's the lowest. Pre-processing data is like something like, okay, like you're always gonna take a hit on that, but there's like, you could definitely improve pre-processing data, but like that's not fundamentally like what our model will work on, right? So by looking at these like different error statistics, we were able to see like what part of our black box is working the least. Uh, so yeah, that's like, that's like all I have time for, so. Yep, that's the end of lecture. Uh, thanks for coming. Oh yeah, just a quick note. Um, when I mentioned kernels earlier on, like kernels are not just applicable to SVMs. Like you can do kernelized linear regression, kernelized ridge regression, kernelized like k nearest neighbors, uh, kernelized clustering. So like kernels have like a wide variety of applications to things that are not just SVMs. Okay. Oh yeah, homework three is out and is due next Thursday at midnight. Cool. Hey, what's up? This is more of a like uh, personal project question. So okay. I've got oh. like uh, I've I've got like a bunch of data on uh, on renewals. So like there's a company and they've got like all these renewals or all these uh, clients and they oh like, no you uh, can't like, from their database, thank you so much uh, like indicating. Thanks for saving Rohan's ass. Yes, yeah, those are the names. Uh, wait, uh, um, that's me. Like oh, really? Oh, wait, I got it. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out, like, um, I want to, I want to, like, get some, like, insight into the data. Like, what's the best way to, like, start like, trying to figure out how to classify whether they're real? Unreal! That is crazy. Uh, you can only take, uh, what was it? The whole resistance. Well, one of you, check it. One of you should work. Whether yeah, like, like, one of you, I feel like, 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 like I have two pieces instead of one. Yeah, sure, whatever. <laughs> 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 how about you open it? Also, I have a question. Yeah. What kind of, like, is there anywhere I can, like, practice, like, implementing, like, these, like, mini regression or SPF, um, that kind of thing? How can I? Do you want, like, specific projects to, like, yeah. Um, what's it? Kaggle's really good. Yeah. That's, like, the one that comes off the top of my head. Really, like, Oh man! Uh, um, and then, like, Kaggle. Yeah, yeah, Kaggle. That's that's pretty much the big one. They have like everything. They kind of have a monopoly, I think. Okay. Um. Other than, yeah, nice. <laughs> other than that, I think like you play around with like some of the common data sets, like maybe Admix. Okay. I think these ones use a lot. And then so you can, C far is good. Okay. Oh, wait, sorry, what's your name? You Felipe? Felipe? Okay. Felipe. Okay. Like, Felipe. Like, Felipe. Felipe, okay. Felipe, okay. <laughs> 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 so, okay. Alright. So that's a good way to put oh, well. it. I guess there's three others who just could get the candy. I'll take theirs. Give it to them next time. Yeah, yeah, you can. That's another way to fill in missing data. So you could use that too. Wait. Is there a midterm here? Oh, we should go then. Okay. Uh...